Hey, this is Patrick Sullivan. Welcome to my shop. There are, I don't know, maybe hundreds of videos on making various crosscut sleds and jigs. Personally, I've made at least 30 different devices for helping me make crosscuts on my table saw. I also produced a popular video on making a super accurate sled for mitered crosscuts. However, this is not one more video on building a specialty sled. This is a set of tips that I think work day in, day out. This is about those features of crosscut jigs that make them an excellent choice for a typical small home workshop that faces a wide variety of projects. Oh sure, I might throw in a couple of chase scenes and a big explosion or two, but mostly we'll talk about how to persuade a table saw to make crosscuts that are fast, precise, and safe. Some people steer away from the whole topic by using their table saw only for rip cuts. They do almost all their cross cutting on a miter saw. These people typically devote a lot of very valuable real estate in their shop to a big dedicated miter saw station that can accommodate long boards and maybe, hopefully, can contain some of the sawdust that the miter saw throws everywhere. Well, I own a miter saw and it works just fine. However, I don't have room in my crowded shop for a long, dedicated miter saw station. And I don't like to cut very small pieces on the miter saw. So for a variety of reasons, I still do a lot of my crosscut work on my table saw. My hunch is that many other woodworkers are like me. Their table saw is the shop's centerpiece, and they want to make that one saw as versatile as they can. Of course, you can make a simple right angle crosscut guide very easily, and I'm sure you don't need detailed directions for it. It consists of gluing two pieces of wood together. However, I'm going to try to show you how to improve on this idea. Maybe we can focus on ways to really improve our workflow. I think I hear my sled dogs barking out in the shop now. Let me put on my crosscut shoes and I'll give you a little tour of the three things that have proved to be, in my humble opinion, the most useful ideas I've found over a lifetime of trial and error. I'm gonna show you three pieces of gear and you really need all three. The crosscut device that came with your saw is the miter gauge. It's a small lightweight device that slides in just one of your table saw slots. If you don't like the miter gauge you already own, you can make a simple 90 degree jig out of wood scraps and it costs you practically nothing. I've made many of these. You don't have to spend money. However, this fancier and costlier one is the jig that I've settled on. Why? Well, first, the metal runner can be adjusted to fit into your slots perfectly without any slop. Wooden runners that are snug fits tend to bind when the humidity goes up and tend to get loose during dry months. Not a fatal flaw, but a small nuisance if high accuracy is your goal. Sometimes they warp. That is a fatal flaw. This miter adjustment has a precision stop at 90 degrees. It's bang on. I can count on it. Need a hexagon or an octagon? It has precise stops for many common polygons and angles. It needs a fence about 14 inches or 350 millimeters long. I've made fences much longer for example, three feet or one meter, but they're sort of clumsy and they're very awkward to store. My first fence was made of MDF and it worked fine. I switched to this beautiful aluminum extrusion in part because I liked the look, but it has another very significant advantage. It's trivially easy to add a sliding stop block. Convenient sliding stops are a brilliant way to cut identical parts very quickly. Notice the sandpaper glued to the front face. This is very important when cutting steep angles. If the front face of the fence is slippery, the work can vibrate and slide into the saw blade, pinching it. If it just pinches the front edge of the blade, you'll probably simply get some burning. If it pinches the back edge, the saw may throw the workpiece at your face. This fence is easily adjustable. It allows you to slide the fence to provide support near the blade on angled cuts. I secure the fence with shop-made thumb screws that do not require a screwdriver or any tool. That means I'm far more likely to adjust the fence. 
Incidentally, if the price of the anchor gauge is a stumbling block, you can get a well-made Chinese knockoff for about half the price. I'm including a link to the Banggood product below. I first learned about this product from Dennis at Hooked on Wood. Check out his site for lots more details. The link to his video is in the description below as well. Despite owning a first-class miter gauge, you also need a cross-cut sled. Why? Well, there are a number of powerful reasons. First, the sled runs in both table slots, giving it both better stability and less opportunity for wobble. But the big difference is that the sled is a carriage jig. That is, it carries the work. The work sits on top of it, immobile, stationary against the fence. This is the ultimate design for safety. The only thing that moves is the jig itself, and the jig is captured in cast iron slots that we are certain are straight and parallel to the blade. If you have any reason to suspect that your blade and table slots are not parallel, you might want to move that project to the top of your priority list. I've built and used at least a dozen different crosscut sleds. This is the best one. What makes this sled better than all the others? Let me go through some of the reasons that I think are important. First, the size. I have built several bigger sleds. One was actually larger than my table saw. The problem is that big sleds are heavy and awkward. This is the biggest sled I can swing around fairly effortlessly. It weighs a little over 11 pounds, or about 5 kilos. An even bigger problem is storage. If you work in an airplane hangar with acres of space, then you can have sleds for every purpose under the sun including ones for very large pieces of wood. My shop is so crowded that I can only justify one sled. I've also built tiny sleds. This one is actually from my disc sander, but I have made table saw sleds this small. Unfortunately, they're just not very versatile. I use my current larger jig for small precision work like clocks and jewelry boxes, but it can also handle chair legs and cabinet frames and pretty substantial furniture. Longer, heavier boards, like this slab of cocobolo, can be supported with a scrap of half-inch plywood on the saw table. The base is made from high-quality half-inch plywood. In fact, it's 12 millimeters, so it's a little under one half-inch thick. There is no big advantage to three-quarter inch or 18 millimeter ply for a jig of this size, and it increases the weight, which is bad. On the other hand, six millimeter or quarter-inch ply flexes too much. 12 millimeter ply is also thick enough that you can cut two dados in the bottom to receive the runners. The dados guarantee that the runners will be parallel to each other and parallel to the edges of the base. They also permit thicker runners, although I failed to do it on this jig. Thicker runners actually stiffen the base and you do not need any screws to hold them rigidly in place. I use this technique almost all the time now. The leading edge of the jig needs a piece which looks like a fence. However, its only purpose is to keep the base flat. I have tried sleds without this stabilizer, and they've all disappointed me in the end. The real fence is at the back. I've used a variety of materials and sizes for this fence. I now make one inch or 24 millimeter plywood by gluing up two pieces of half inch or 12 millimeter. This is dimensionally much more stable, and it has another important advantage that I'll get to in a moment. This view shows you how I joined the two pieces of the fence for maximum stability, but you could also just butt them together. The big danger with crosscut sleds is that the saw blade sneakily appears, without any warning, from the back of the fence. There's a natural tendency for your thumbs to be loitering in the blade's path with very unpleasant consequences. Call me cowardly, but I'm very attached to my thumbs. So, I make it extremely difficult for my careless thumbs to wander into the blade. These two wings help to keep the fence perfectly vertical, and simultaneously, they block my hand from sliding into the saw path. This works like a charm, and it requires no thought. But I still don't want the naked spinning blade exposed at the back. In actual use, the cut is complete before the blade is exposed. 
when the high point of the blade is at the fence, the leading edge is still pretty well guarded by the back of the jig. But if you carelessly push the sled too far forward, there's a risk of touching the spinning blade. My solution was to glue in a piece of hardwood between the wings, as shown here. It shrouds the blade, and it also functions as a handle for the jig. This design has been very successful, and I feel it increases the safety of the jig. Now back to the top of the fence. Many sleds that I have seen, and actually built, try to get away with a low fence. However, you obviously don't want the saw blade to cut the fence in half, because the jig will be in two separate pieces. So many makers include a raised section over the blade, like the front fence on my jig. This ties the left and the right halves of the sled together. My current version uses a higher straight fence because it allows you to install a track all the way across the top. One of the big advantages of a sled is that it facilitates the use of stop blocks. The most convenient stop block you can use is a flip-up stop that slides in a track and can be adjusted without clamps or tools. I probably use the stop in 70% of the cuts I make on this jig. I made this stop from some hardwood scraps, and it works well. You can also buy stops elegantly made from anodized aluminum that fit in universal track. Should the sled have a hold down clamp? I think it's unnecessary for most of the work I do. I feel very safe using my fingers as the hold down device most of the time. I'm also willing to let my fingers get much closer to the blade as long as my hand is firmly braced on the sled fence. Because the workpiece is carried by the sled, it has no tendency to pinch the blade or slip around. As long as my hands are locked onto the sled, I'm confident that they will not drift into the blade. But now we have to turn to the third essential piece of gear. The jigs have to be stored within one step of the saw. Let me repeat that. The jigs have to be instantly available. Okay, not actually instant, but super convenient. If the jig is hanging on a wall on the other side of your shop, or at the bottom of a drawer somewhere, it does not get used. Well, maybe if you graduated from the Anal Compulsive School of Woodworking, you would use it. But for the other 95% of us who are trained in corner cutting at the Academy of Slackers, a useful jig has to be effortless. If it takes an extra 30 seconds to set it up, it will be like your mother's sterling silverware. We just won't use it except on very special occasions. But take a look at my shop. Table saws are usually placed in the middle of the shop. That's so you'll have room to maneuver long pieces of wood at both the infeed and the outfeed ends and at the sides for wide pieces. Therefore, you probably will not have a wall or storage cabinets right next to your saw. I hope you can see the logical problem. My solution was to build a simple storage cabinet that fits under my saw table extension. I'll show you. I know, I know, it's not gorgeous. But guys, it's just a tool rack. Its primary purpose was to give the crosscut sled a home. This means that I can grab my sled without taking a single step. I store it vertically, so I won't be tempted to put anything on top of it. But I have other equipment that I also need at the saw. This cabinet gives those important accessories an excellent place to hang out. First and foremost are a couple of good push sticks. I want them where I can reach them easily while in the middle of a cut if necessary. I also store a magnetic feather board. I love this gadget and I use it on most rip cuts. It helps to make more consistent and accurate rips, but it's also a great safety device. It keeps my fingers away from the blade and it discourages kickbacks. The magnetic version is way faster than all the older featherboard designs. It's definitely worth the price. Again, you have to use it regularly for it to be effective. I also need a square to check cuts and check my reference surfaces. See I'm hanging there ready to go? A tape measure that's always available is really handy. I made it large enough to handle even my big construction tapes which sometimes somehow migrate onto my saw. On the far side of this case, I have a bracket that holds my miter gauge. This is handy enough to encourage me to whip out this small jig quickly every time it's needed. It also protects this precision instrument when it's not in use. You know, drop it on a concrete floor and you may need to do some serious recalibration. 
These are the three legs that support this strategy. An accurate and versatile miter gauge is a quick solution to a lot of difficult cuts. Its lightweight and small size make it handy. The crosscut sled tames much of the treacherous risk of the table saw and enables precision work over a wide range of sizes. However, to take advantage of it, the sled has to be a reasonable size and weight, and it has to live in a spot where it can be accessed instantly and painlessly. Remember, jigs that are stored on the other side of the shop may as well be in your neighbor's garage. Jigs have to be ready to jump into action as fast as a hockey substitution. I'll post a drawing on my website that shows the dimensions of the sled that I like. I also have a template for the wooden knobs that I used on my miter cage. As usual, they're free. Look in the description below for the website, links to videos, and links to some of the products that I used. If you've gotten this far, you might as well click the like button. For that matter, why not subscribe as well? But regardless of what you do, thanks for watching.